Good morning. Welcome to Victorious Faith. I'm Cherry Campbell. This week, we have been continuing our study on who we are in Christ. In this study, we are learning about our identity in Christ. The New Testament reveals to us many things about who we are, what we have, and what we can do in Christ and through Christ. And therefore, we need to see our new identity in Him. Praise the Lord. And yesterday, we finished looking at scriptures in the New Testament that use phrases like, in Christ, by Christ, from Christ, with Christ, through Christ. We read one scripture yesterday that I want to go back to, and that is in Hebrews 3.14. Hebrews 3.14 says, We have come to share in Christ. Share in Christ. What do we share in Christ? Everything. Everything that he is, everything that he has, and everything that he can do. What he is, you are in him. What he has, you have in him. What you, what he can do, you can do in him. And we also looked at some scriptures about the grace of God. And I wanted to also take another look at that because the Fallen sinful nature has a mentality that is negative. And that mentality is always connected to defeat and failure, unworthiness, shame. And if we identify ourselves with that fallen nature, we will always live in that low place of defeat, shame, unworthiness, not able to do anything. But we need to identify ourselves in Christ and in him. We always have the victory. We have his life. We have his power. And somebody, you know, would ask this question because it is taught even in a lot of churches And it is a wrong teaching based on the sinful fallen nature. It is the mentality of the fallen nature. It's the mentality that is defeated. And this is a wrong teaching that we need to get out of our thinking. And we need to have our minds renewed in Christ to know who we are in Christ. And that is regarding Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And some people will teach this. It's been preached in many churches that God said no to to Paul. When Paul was praying and asking him for help and assistance, it says in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8, three times I pleaded with the Lord To take it away from me. Now, I'm not going to go into the part on the thorn in the flesh. We don't have time for that. But it is a messenger of Satan referred to in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. The thorn in the flesh is nothing more. It's not sickness. It's not disease. It's what he was just telling us about in chapter 11. It is that messenger of Satan that followed him everywhere he went and brought disruption that brought the... um, the shipwreck and the beatings and the floggings, all of that that's named in Second Corinthians 11. So then let's move on to verse 8 of, of chapter 12, Second Corinthians 12, 8. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Verse 9, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. And it has been a tradition taught in the churches for hundreds of years based on sinful fallen nature mentality, defeat mentality, that God's answer to Paul was, no, I'm not going to do anything about it. You're just going to have to suffer with this. And that has been preached in the churches so that many Christians feel like the troubles and the trials that they're going through. God is saying to them, 
no, I'm not going to do anything about this. You are going to have to suffer with this a little bit longer. This is you're on your own. I'm not doing anything about this. That's a lie of the devil. That's one of the biggest lies of the devil. The devil is saying that not God. And that is nowhere in the meaning of these verses. God's answer to Paul is not a no answer. It's a yes answer. It's not a no, Paul, I'm not going to do anything. It's a yes answer. And so let's take a look at this. Even remember, we have to always interpret scripture in context. Well, Paul himself that wrote in the same book in chapter one, second Corinthians chapter one, verse starting in verse 18, second Corinthians one eighteen. But as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by me, Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no. But in him, it has always been what? Yes. Yes. Verse 20. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are what? Yes. In Christ. There's our in Christ. In Christ, the promises are always yes. God's answer is always yes. Now, Paul wrote this. In the very same book, 2 Corinthians. And he wrote it in 2 Corinthians 1, which is before 2 Corinthians 12. So if Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 1 that the, God's message is not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. For the, no matter how many promises God has made, they are are yes in Christ. Well, if Paul said God's answer is not yes and no, but it's always yes. Then why do people misinterpret second Corinthians 12, nine and think God is saying, no, Paul, no, Paul, I'm not going to do anything about this. I'm not going to do anything. You're just going to have to suffer with this. That is not what God said. Even Paul knows that God's answer is always yes. And this answer in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 is a yes answer. It's a yes answer. Even in chapter 10, 2 Corinthians 10. Well, let, let me come back to that in a second. What is the answer that God gave? My Grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. You see, that's not a no answer. That's a yes answer. He did not say my grace is insufficient. You're not going to have enough. No, it is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. Well, then that comes back to the problem that people don't even understand grace. They think that it's just simply a pat on the back, pat on the back, tough it out, do it on your own, hang in there, and eventually you'll make it to the end, even if you die early. No, that's not what God was saying. He is saying, my grace is sufficient for you. So then he's saying, my grace is enough, sufficient does not mean not enough. Sufficient means enough. It is enough. So what he's saying is, I've already given you enough. I have already given you enough. So let's look at what is grace. Grace is God's eager willingness to give you everything you need. If you go back to the very, very, very basic meaning of grace, 
it is free gift, free gift. And I've said this before, when you read the word grace in the New Testament, it would do you well to always translate it and change it to the words free gift or gifts, free gifts, because that's what grace is. Grace is a free gift. That's why in Romans, it always contrasts it with works because when you work, your, your pay is, is paid to you as wages. But when you don't work, it's a free gift. So it's by grace, not work. So it's a free gift, not earned. And so the free gifts of God, grace is actually, it's, Basic meaning is free. And then you build on that and you get the a phrase free gifts. And then you expand that and you see it is God's intense desire to give. I want you to understand God is love and love is never satisfied until it is expressed. Love is expressed through giving. Grace is that nature of giving grace a a, a synonym for grace is or, or a person who has grace is benevolence or charitableness, benevolence or charitableness. It is the attitude of being eager and willing to give, but with God It's more than a willingness. It's more than an eagerness. It is an intense desire of God's. God has intense desire to give to you everything you need. And it includes with it lavishness. And it is universal, meaning to everybody. So grace is God's intense desire desire and eager willingness to give you liberally and lavishly and abundantly everything you need and not only you but universally to all to all it's for all and so what we see is grace is God's freeness to give liberally everything you need Now, let's look at some scriptures in the New Testament that confirm this. Here we see it in John 1, 16, John 1, 16, from the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. You receive one blessing after another from what? The fullness of his grace. Romans 5, 17 Romans 5, 17, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace? How much grace does God give abundant provision? God gives abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So what will happen if you receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness? You Reign in life. Reign in life is like reigning like a king. You reign like a king. You get victory in life when you receive of his abundant provision of grace. Again, in Second Corinthians 9, 8, Second Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. All grace abound to you so that in all things at all times, Having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And yes, as we've talked before, Second Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9 are talking about money because they're receiving an offering. But with grace, it goes more, it goes beyond. It goes beyond money. It goes to everything you need. And so in that, grace, another word that people have used for grace is empowerment. Empowerment. It is empowerment to have what you need to have to do what you need to do. In that empowerment, you'll have strength. In that empowerment, you have wisdom. 
in that empowerment, you have financial resources. You're empowered financially to do things. In that empowerment, you have health and uh, physical health and strength. In that empowerment, you have people who will come alongside to help, to aid, to assist. There is empowerment of all things that you need. Financial, physical, material, the aid of other people, the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding. Everything you need to to have what you need to have to do what you need to do. And that is what grace is. Grace is God giving you everything you need to have and everything you need to do. And so we see that he makes all grace abound to you so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So with that, you have all that you need. You have physical strength and health. You have financial resources. You've got the wisdom and the knowledge and the know-how. You've got people come alongside to help. You've got the wisdom. I already said that, but then you've got everything you need. To to be what God called you to be, to do what God called you to do. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And then we go on and read more scriptures on grace. Ephesians 1, 6. Ephesians 1, 6. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us. Freely given us in the one he loves. So he's freely given it to us in Christ. Hallelujah. And then. First Timothy one fourteen. First Timothy one fourteen. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. Now Paul is writing here. Paul is writing to Timothy. And Paul said, The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. 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 Glory to God. Second Timothy one nine. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. When was grace given to you before the beginning of time? Second Timothy two one. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So you see in the grace is the strength you need. Titus 2, 11 to 13 for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to who to all men. It's universal. Grace is universal. Now, not everyone has received it. You see, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, but not all men have received the grace for salvation. Many have rejected it. Many are ignorant of it. And there are even many Christians who are ignorant of his grace that will help them be overcomers, that will help them be victorious in life. They received the grace for being born again, but they did not receive the grace for being healed. They did not receive the grace for being financially blessed and successful. They did not receive the grace to have victory in marriage and in family and in work and in all areas. They, through lack of knowledge, they have not received the grace. And in Hebrews twelve fifteen, it says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. Don't miss the grace of God. It's available to you. James 4, 6, he gives us more grace. He oppo- God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. There is a requirement for grace. It's humility. And then first Peter one, two grace and peace be yours in abundance. Second Peter three, 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and savior, Jesus Christ. So you have to grow in the grace. You're not going to automatically just receive maximum grace. You grow in it. How through the knowledge of our Lord and savior. Second Peter one, two Again, second Peter one, two grace and peace be yours in abundance. How through the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. So you see again, just like second Peter, well, the, um, one, three says that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him. Uh, he has given us everything we need for life and godliness in the grace. The grace is him giving us everything we need. But how does it come? Through 
our knowledge of him, of his word, of his ways, of what he has given to us and what he has made available to us. So you see, God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. And that grace is it, we grow in it in the same way and in proportion to how we grow in the knowledge of it, in the knowledge of God, of the knowledge of his word, the knowledge and revelation of who we are in Christ. Then we grow in that grace. So you see, going back to second Corinthians 12, nine, when God said, my grace is sufficient for you. That was not a no answer saying, no, Paul, I'm not going to give it to you. No. His answer was a yes answer. He said, my grace is sufficient. That means it is enough. And what is grace? I've given you everything you need already. Already. And Paul is the one preaching on this. I mean, he writes about it in Ephesians 1, 3. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And he has given us this grace. He lavishes his grace. And he even told Timothy in Timothy in first Timothy one 14, the grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. What was this grace, this grace that it makes all grace abound to us so that in all things at all times, having all that we need, we abound in every good work. God was telling him, I've already given you everything you need. His answer was, use it. Use it. Take it. Walk in it. And you see, Paul already knew that. It's just that he had a moment. You and I, we we have moments where we get into a pity party And we start feeling sorry for us. And he started whining to God, God, take the devil off of me. Get the devil off of me. Get him off of me. And he's whining in this short moment, but he quickly recovered. Praise the Lord. When he knew God said, I've already given you everything you need. What did God give to him? God already gave the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And as we've said before, take that sword of the spirit, the word of God and jab it, jab it into your situation. It's an offensive weapon. Also, Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. So Jesus gave us his name. And with that name in We do everything. We bind Satan. We've already given, he's given us authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. That's authority. So now we've got the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the word of God, even the same word that Jesus used in Matthew four and Luke four, when he resisted the devil, he used the word saying it is written, it is written. And the devil left him. The devil left Jesus when Jesus said it is written. Jesus also gave us his name. He's also given us authority. And Paul knew it. He writes about it. He preaches about it. And yet he had let it slip and said, God, get the devil off of me. And God said, I've already given you everything you need. My grace is sufficient for you. My grace gives you everything you need so that you can, uh, in all things at all times, abound in every good work. You use my sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You use the word, use my name, use that authority that I gave you to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Use the blood of Jesus, plead the blood, use the, these things that I've given you use my precious promises. I've already done it. God said, I've already blessed you. I've already given you everything you need for life and godliness. So what he's saying is get up and walk in what I've already given you. Get up and walk in what I've already given you. And you see, Paul knew it because even the chapter or two chapters before second Corinthians 10, four, Second Corinthians 10, four, or even verse three, 10, three, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war 
as the world does. Verse 4, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And it goes on. He says, we do not wage war as the world does. And he knew that. And actually, he's just sharing a testimony of how he knew that he was supposed to wage war with the sword of the spirit, with the name of Jesus. And he was supposed to stand firm in the grace that God had given him because the grace was sufficient for him. And with that grace, it's everything in the grace. The grace is everything that God has. The grace is everything that God is and God has made available to you and me. Everything God is and everything God has made available to you and me. Paul knew it. He just had to, had to wake up to that one more time and make use of what was already given. And God is saying, you make use of what he has already given you in Christ. Make use of it. Walk in it. Walk in the grace. Walk in the righteousness. Walk in the victory. Walk in the life. Walk in the joy. Walk in the peace. Take the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that God has made available to you. You take them, enjoy them, and walk in them. I'm out of time. Now join me again next Next week, as we continue our study, and remember, God loves you, you are blessed and highly favored by the Lord.